I'm speaking today on the subject, worshipers come and worship. While you're finding your place in your Bible or you have it there, thank God for the mercy seat. If you're a newer believer or you haven't studied about the mercy seat, the mercy seat was in the Holy of Holies. And the high priest one day a year would take blood and the blood would serve as a covering for their sins only for a year. But then that was just a picture. It was a shadow of what would become substance in the person of Jesus Christ. When Jesus died on the cross, he entered into the holy of holies in heaven and sprinkled his precious blood without spot and without blemish on the mercy seat. And no longer was it just a covering for our sin, but it washed away our sins once and for all and forever. The sacrificial system was no longer needed. And so thank God. So now we can go into the presence of Christ. As we studied last week, the veil in the temple that separated man from God was Jesus Christ, the flesh of God's Son. You see it so beautifully illustrated in Hebrews 10, verses 19, 20, and 21. Our attention today is going to be focused on verses 22 and 23. Stand with me in honor of the reading of God's Word. The Bible says, therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter into the holiness, how? By the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God. Here's the invite for today. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Speak to our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. There's a lot of definitions out there for worship, just as there's a lot for love and serve and invite. Ronald Allen in a commentary said, Worship is an active response to God whereby we declare his worth. Worship is not simply a mood. It is a response. Worship is not just a feeling. It is a declaration. And then last, my friend Albert Moeller at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary said, worship is something we do, not just something we attend. It's not merely an issue for the pastor and other ministers, nor for the musicians and those who plan the service. Worship is an issue for the entire congregation, for worship is something we do together. John Piper said, many people are discovering the joy of meeting God in the extended times of emotionally charged singing to the Lord. He said, I I personally find such seasons of lingering before the Lord a very rich communion with Him, but I see a danger. The danger is that we subtly slip from loving God in these moments into loving God loving God we begin to savor not the glory of God but the atmosphere created by worship when this happens we open ourselves to hypocrisy we say it differently 25 years ago somebody say shucks I don't know why there's any preaching as far as I'm concerned they could just sung the whole service well just since you haven't asked me The Bible says God has used the foolishness of preaching to save those who would believe. He never said he uses the foolishness of singing. It's preaching. The Bible says desire the the greater gifts, and the greater gift is the proclamation of the Word of God. I didn't write the order of worship. God did. So I believe you ought to preach the Word. And since I believe you ought to do that, I'm going to show up and preach when I can. So with that in mind, in verse number 22, he talks about preparation, and he gives us four statements. I want you to see this. This is beautiful. I've never dealt with this before to this extent. He says, let us draw near. That's the language of worship from the Old Testament. The book of Hebrews has more of the Old Testament in it than any book in the New Testament. James chapter 4 and verse 8, the half-brother of the Lord Jesus Christ gave this promise and invitation. He said, draw near to God and God will draw near to you. The Israelite family 
would make his way to the temple. They brought a lamb to a priest, and the priest would offer that lamb as a sacrifice to God on behalf of that family. It was a worship experience. As it was sacrificed and placed on the altar, it was going to soon be consumed by the fire of the altar. The family would stand there and watch as the smoke from the sacrifice ascended upward toward God and as the smoke ascended upward in their spirit, that was their prayer that they also would ascend upward and it was a picture of drawing near to God. In prayer, we offer up our prayers to God and as our prayers ascend, it's our prayer that our hearts would ascend and we would draw near to God. And so worship is a time to draw near to God to God the word that he uses there is present present tense it means be continuously drawing near to God every day and the neat thing is since the the access to the throne of God is now open sometimes you're riding down the road and you're crying out and calling out to God it's not just during your prayer times Charles Spurgeon said one time that he could count on one hand the times that he's knelt and spent an hour in God's presence he said but before you judge me I can count on one hand the times I've gone an hour without praying the Bible says we ought to pray without ceasing it's constantly on our mind the needs the burdens that God has placed there by the way it's uh, uh, a command to be obeyed. This is not an option. Y'all draw near if you want to. He's saying, I'm commanding you as my children. Come into my presence continuously. Oswald Chambers put it this way. Worship is giving God the best that he's given you. Be careful what you do with the best you have. Whenever you get a blessing from God, give it back to him as a love gift. Take time to meditate before God and offer the blessing back to him in a deliberate act of worship. I will stand before the bema of Jesus Christ one day, the judgment seat of Christ. I will be there because God has given me spiritual endowment. He gives me energy. I have life this morning, a lot of energy. I take this energy God's given me in order to take the endowment God has given me to exercise it for the glory of God. I want to say something to Church of Jesus Christ today. If you're a child of God, you have access to God, you're not just to pray for others, but if you don't speak to them, nobody else will. This is the only body that God has commissioned with the gospel. God help us to be faithful. For if we're not faithful, there is no alternative. Come and worship. Well, is there requirements? Now, if i got to prepare myself to have a good time with God, I do. It begins with sincerity in worship. Did you see it in verse number 22? The Bible says, let us draw near with a true heart. My friend Erwin Lutzer said, to worship in spirit is to draw near to God with an undivided heart. The word true is implied there, the word sincere. It means without superficiality or ulterior motive. It speaks of loyalty. It means when you come in the presence of Jesus, you come with transparency. It means there's no gal or sham. I promise you, I never approach this place of worship, make my appeal for the offerings because there's something I'm trying to get you to give me. I'm trying to get you to know him better. And I've found that I know of no better way than a life of obedience and transparency and sincerity and worship to God's Son to do that. We have record in the Bible in Jeremiah. He was a very passionate preacher. In Jeremiah 3.10, he talked about people coming that weren't sincere. And then by, by the time he got to chapter 24, he had them coming in the right spirit. Listen to this. Jeremiah 3.10, and yet for all this, her treacherous Sister Judah has not turned to me with her whole heart, but in pretense, says the Lord. God knows whether you're serious or not. But in Jeremiah 24, 7, he says, Then I will give them a heart to know me, that I am the Lord, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God, for they shall return to me. Here it is with a whole heart. I found in this text, and I just mentioned it before I moved to another statement, that true worship calls for three responses. In verse 22, the Bible says, let us draw near. Verse 23, let us hold fast. Verse 24, let us consider one another. 
When I come to worship, it is normally at least threefold. Number one, it is upward. When I come, I am to draw near. My focus and my prayer time is on the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one. He's the object of my faith. He is the object of my intercession. But it's not just upward when you go. It's inward. The Bible says in verse 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. I want to be faithful as I go into his presence. And so I have to go in inwardly. And sometimes I've wavered. Sometimes I've bent during the week. Sometimes I've doubted during the week. And so now it becomes a time of confession. It begins upward, but before too long, it's inward. And then before you leave your prayer time, it's become outward. The Bible says, let us consider one another. So prayer is upward. You go to the praise Almighty God. It's inward. You check your own heart. It's outward. You pray for other people. Sincerity in heart. But number two, security of approval. Notice what the Bible says I'm to do. This is to prepare my heart. He says, let us draw near with a true heart, but look what's going on in my heart. A heart that's full of assurance of faith. Why is my heart so full of faith that God hears me? It speaks of an unqualified assurance in what Jesus Christ did. Jesus is God's acceptable sacrifice that gives me access. I go into God's presence and the reason my heart is full of faith is not because I'm worthy, but because Jesus was. I'm not there because of what I did to rend the, the veil in the temple. I'm there because Jesus Christ, it was his flesh that was rent in the, in the temple. I'm there because of what Jesus did for me. So I can go and say, God, I'm glad to be here this morning in the name of Jesus. Here's what he's saying. I want to make sure you see this. He's saying he's absolutely sufficient. It requires commitment that is genuine. The writer encourages a faith that's progressive. Listen to it in Hebrews 6, 9. But beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner. For God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love, which you've shown toward his name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end, that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promise. When the Bible says with full faith, the word full in the Greek New Testament is the word glut. That's interesting. I've never seen that. Glut. If you're wondering where are you going with that, it's where we get our word gluttony. What is gluttony? I can't eat another thing. I ate too much. Well, what he's saying is when you come to God... <laughs> It's kind of getting me before I'm going to tell it, and I'm about to have my own little personal glorified spell right here thinking about it. But here, here's what he's saying. When you come, be so assured that what I did on the cross opened the way and has made access for you, come plumb full of faith. I mean, be so full of faith, there ain't room for anything else. And it's not faith in yourself. The object of your faith is the finished work of Jesus Christ in praying. Well, let me go a step further. I'm trying to get prepared. I'm going into his presence. So he's made the way through the blood of Jesus so my heart's sincere. I'm not going there with superficiality. Matter of fact, when I don't feel like praying, but I know I need to, I kneel and tell God, I need you to help me. I'm here right now and don't feel like it. My mind's somewhere else, but I know I need to draw near. So there's sincerity in your heart. You've moved into his presence and there's security of approval that God has made a way. But then he refers to our hearts being sprinkled and it cleans your conscience. I want you to see this. What happened in the Old Testament could never clear your conscience. Even though the high priest went in, sprinkled the blood and your sins were covered for a year, you still felt guilty. Thank God that Jesus Christ not only forgives us from the guilt of sin, I bless his dear name, he forgives us of the grip of sin. And so he says, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. The Bible says in Hebrews 9.22, I'm doing the Lord's Supper two weeks from tonight, two weeks from tonight, and we're reminded and according to the law, most all things are purified by blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no sending away of your sin, no forgiveness. 
Listen to what the Bible says about the Old Testament sacrifice in Hebrews 10, verse 1. For the law, having a shadow, remember it wasn't the substance, it was a shadow, it was a picture, an image of the good things to come, not the very image of the things. It can never, with these same sacrifices, which they offer continually, year by year, make those who approach perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered. For the worshipers, once purified, would have had no more consciousness of sin. That is, had that been a perfect sacrifice. But it was just a shadow of the perfect sacrifice. Had it been the perfect sacrifice, Chris, the Bible is saying that their conscience would have been clean. There'd have been no need to come back. But the reason they kept coming back, their conscience said, we've got to get back over there and offer a sacrifice. But then listen to what Hebrews 9.14 says. How much more shall the blood of Christ, we just changed sacrifices, no longer bulls and lambs and pigeons. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from the deep, the dead works to serve the living God. Isn't that awesome? Isn't it great when somebody gets saved and God washes away their sins and gives you a good conscience and you can lay down at night, listen to me, not because of what you did for God, but because of what Jesus did for you. This text is all about Jesus. I've missed in preaching if I don't convey that message. And so I can lay down at night, and if I, if I have the thought that I may not see another day, it doesn't matter. I'm telling you, my conscience is clear. I'm ready to face God. Only the blood of Jesus can do that. The conscience condemns us and reminds us of our guilt, and, and guilt cannot be removed until the sin is removed. When Jesus died, his blood removed our sins. And when we embrace him by faith, our conscience becomes free from guilt and we're cleansed from an evil conscience. Doesn't mean you forget what you did. It's just that you don't feel condemned for doing it anymore. Let me talk about the fourth part of preparation. I've come and best I know, God, my heart is sincere. I'm not here with duplicity. I love you. I'm not what I ought to be, but thanks be unto God, that's not why I'm here. I'm here because you were everything you needed to be. And so, Lord, I'm coming into your presence, and as I draw near, my heart's full of faith in what you did. Thank God I have no trouble believing that on Friday you died, and Saturday you were in the tomb, and Sunday you got up. My heart's been sprinkled, Lord. You took the blood of Jesus, that one-time sacrifice, that I dealt with last week for the new and living way and new being freshly, freshly slaughtered as though it happened yesterday. Thank God for that. Wow. Better leave that alone. And then when an evil conscience, our bodies have been washed with pure water. This speaks of the Spirit of God purifying one's life by means of the Word of God. Uh, listen to what the Bible says in Ephesians 5.26, that God might sanctify, speaking of the church, and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. The blood did an internal work, and the water does an internal and external work. The word of God referred to the laver. Before a priest would go in to worship God or to offer a sacrifice, he would wash his hands in the laver. The labor is a picture of the Word of God. And so we, we get clean. The Bible says in John 15, 3, you're clean by the Word which I've spoken unto you. Let me tell you what you'll always find in worship, two things God requires, always. You'll find it all through the Bible. God requires clean hands and pure hearts. The psalmist in Psalm 51, verse 17 says, God requires truth in the inward parts not just what you see out here but what he knows is inside listen to the psalmist psalms 24 verse 3 who may ascend into the hill of the lord or who may stand in his holy place that is who can come into the holy place to talk to god he who has clean hands and a pure heart who's not lifted up his soul to an idol nor sworn deceitfully 
take sprinkled hearts, that's the blood of Christ, and spirits purifying with the water, that's the word of God. When a person comes to Christ, both of these take place. Christ's death pays the penalty of sin for us and God is satisfied. And the cleansing act of the Holy Spirit begins to change us on the inside and he is satisfied. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore any person in Christ is a new creation. Old things are passing away. Behold, all things are becoming new. How? By the blood of Jesus and the sanctifying process and purifying process of God's word. So God's justice and righteousness are both satisfied, and because of this, a believer can come into God's presence with confidence. Now, the Bible teaches that these four things God is looking for, for worshipers. Lord, best I know how, my heart's sincere. I humble myself before you. Lord Jesus, I'm full of faith that the Christ, Christ's death was sufficient to open the way for me to come. I come in Jesus' name. My heart has been cleansed by your blood. I have been ministered to and purified by the washing of the water of your word. We hear people say that our pastor is preaching a series of messages to minister to the felt needs of our congregation. Well, I could guess some of the needs of our congregation, but to actually stand and act as though I know what the felt needs of this congregation is, is a little spooky to me now, I can't look into your heart and know what's there but my Bible says in Hebrews 4 verses 12 through 16 it says that the Bible the word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword that it has the capacity to discern your thoughts and the intent of your heart so as I preach God's word I believe God's word deals with felt needs but I want to take felt needs from a different perspective now, I want you to listen carefully to me Felt need does not require theological understanding of the doctrine of salvation. We've done a great injustice in our churches. Somebody gets saved in simple childlike faith. They study theology for 25 years, then take their 25 years of learning and go back and question the authenticity of their childlike decision. I believe you ought to really know if you're saved or not, but I'll tell you, when somebody talks about all this stuff you got to know to get saved, I want you to listen to what I'm getting ready to say. Don't tune me out. On the other hand, a person who does not feel a need for salvation, no matter how good his theology is far from faith in God, felt need is essential but inadequate on its own. I went to church, had never read a verse. If they'd have said, quote John 3, 16, be saved, I'd have had to say, I'm going to hell, I'm going to hell. I had no way of knowing. had no theological compass in my life. But I had a felt need. I'd hear that gospel preached and I felt, Lori, I'm a sinner. Nobody would ever convinced me of that. The preaching of God's word made me feel I was a sinner. Let's go ahead and quote someone everyone would know. Let's quote John Newton. John Newton was losing his mind. He was upward in his 80s. And on the bed they said, anything you want to say about Jesus? It was the day of his death, and he said, I don't remember a lot of all that I learned, but I still remember I was a great sinner, and Jesus is a great Savior. Is that enough? Is it enough for an old boy to sit here and just come to church, maybe never been, but the Spirit of God begin to deal with his needs that he's lost, and all he knows is that he's lost. He don't understand the Lordship of Christ. He don't even know you're getting ready to talk to him about the doctrine of baptism, and he certainly doesn't know about tithing because most of the church members hadn't got that. But he feels his need. Well, let me move to another word called content. A person does not have to comprehend the full knowledge and understanding of the doctrine of salvation before he can get saved but he does need the gospel I don't think he can get saved without the gospel what is the gospel that Jesus Christ died according to the scriptures that he was buried and that on the third day he rose from the dead first Corinthians 15 verses 1 through 4 
and that he's lost in sin and he needs Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. A lady called me. I'll never forget. I've never had a call like this before or since. I was pastoring Longleaf Baptist Church. I'd been over in Longleaf Park where Janet and I lived in duplexes that had been built during World War II where the people that built ships on the Cape Fear River lived. And a lady came to church that morning in her 20s, gave her life to Jesus Christ, and her mother called me that afternoon said, what in the world do you think you're doing? I said, ma'am, what do you mean? said, my daughter's never been to church. She went over there and heard you, weren't gone probably an hour and a half, and came back and said her life's been changed forever. She said, how under heaven do you think you can preach a message that can change somebody's life in an hour and a half? Good question. I want to tell you something. Evidently, I didn't make myself clear that morning. It don't take an hour and a half. You can go there and in one split second, the Spirit of God can show you you're lost without Jesus and that you'll go to hell when you die and you can place your faith in Jesus and God, that moment, can change you forever. That's the gospel. But let me make one other statement I'm through. Let's close this message with the word commitment. The climax of faith's commitment. You can feel your felt need and never respond. Die and go to hell. You can be in the context of understanding, feeling you know exactly what you need to do. But there has to come a time of commitment. The climax of faith is commitment. Professing Christ without commitment to Christ is not saving faith. I professed him and committed my life to him. I confessed all I knew of him and confessed all I could understand of even myself. And it is, it is still true. You come to Jesus Christ, are y'all listening? By faith alone, by grace alone, in Christ alone.